Welcome to the Waking Up Podcast. This is Sam Harris. Today I'm speaking with Fareed Zakaria. Fareed is the host of his own show on CNN, Fareed Zakaria GPS. He's also a Washington Post columnist and an editor at The Atlantic. He's the author of several best selling books The Future of Freedom, The Post American World, and most recently, in defense of a liberal education. He was also named by Esquire as the most influential foreign policy advisor of his generation, and foreign policy named him one of the top 100 global thinkers. He and I had a wide-ranging conversation about politics and partisanship and our differing opinions about how to talk about the connection between Islam and the sorts of violence and intolerance we see in the world. We didn't agree about everything, but I think you will find that it was a very productive and civil and honest conversation. And now I give you Fareed Zakaria. I am here with Fareed Zakaria. Fareed, thanks for coming on the podcast. My pleasure, Sam. Well, listen, the tables have turned. I have been on your show at least twice, I think, and uh, now I get to play journalist. It's a, it's a pleasure to uh, get a chance to talk to you about you and your views. It's my pleasure. I'm a little apprehensive, but uh, go, let, let's make it work. Just to begin with a little background on you, everyone is obviously quite familiar with you, but how do you view yourself primarily? Are, are, do you consider yourself a journalist? Because you give your own opinions and, and commentary on, on policy and current events so often. I mean, it really is it is never far from the next thing you're about to say. How do you describe your own job? Yeah, it's a good question. I, I'm a sort of strange bird in the sense that I've never been a reporter. I, at no point in my career, I never pretend to be one. Uh, I have enormous respect for reporters. When I was at Newsweek, uh, I, there were a bunch of brilliant reporters who, uh, who worked with me when I was editing Newsweek International. But I, I'm a commentator, and I really am a lapsed academic. I went into... Uh, a PhD program, thought I f- completed it, uh, wrote a dissertation, got a couple of academic job offers, uh, was all set to begin an academic path. I had been teaching as a graduate student and then sort of stumbled into journalism. I didn't quite stumble into it. You know, when I first got an offer uh, to do something, I hesitated a lot and then I looked at my life. Uh, economists have this wonderful phrase called revealed preferences, which is a fancy way of saying, don't worry about what you say, look at what you've done. And what I'd done with every summer of my life, really since high school, was work at a newspaper or a magazine, you know, done research for an op-ed writer, th- things that were clearly in the realm of journalism. So I took a baby step and I became the managing editor of Foreign Affairs. Then I started writing a column for Newsweek. Then, it, you know, went as a uh, commentator on ABC News. So it's, it's always been commentary, but I was always drawn to the public fora, to being more actively engaged than being an academic. But I still, you know, when I think about how, um, how I've been shaped and the way in which I think about the world, uh, I think my training as a social scientist and as an academic is, is still very, very much at the heart of how I look at problems. And you got your PhD in government at Harvard, is that right? Exactly. I got my PhD in government. In the, the subfield is, was called inter- international relations uh, at Harvard in 1992. Is that synonymous with a political science degree, or is that, or is, or is that an IR degree? How, what is government? So at Harvard, yeah, Harvard, you know, being Harvard once, it, 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 every other um, uh, university calls it political science. Harvard calls it government. But it's exactly, it's a, it's a PhD in political science. And did you study with Samuel Huntington? Yeah, he was my dissertation advisor. He was my closest advisor. He's the guy who kind of offered me a job when I finished my PhD. Yeah. Nice. So perhaps you can remind our listeners of his thesis about the clash of civilizations, which I'm wondering how you think that has fared, because it's certainly come in for a fair amount of opprobrium, at least on the political left. I mean, Huntington and, and also Bernard Lewis got, have gotten fairly hammered by their association with, and their influence on neoconservatives in, in the run-up to the, the war in Iraq. Perhaps you can give a, a kind of potted history of that for our listeners. Sure. I, have, I actually have a very personal connection to it because um, Sam was my dissertation advisor. I, I went to him one day and said, 
I have this job offer at Foreign Affairs. Um, do you think I should do it? And he said, no, absolutely not. You should take this other job I, I, I think you'd be very good at, which is an assistant professor at Harvard. At Harvard, they never offer you a job. Of course, they invite you to apply for it, but he did it in a way that suggested that I, I thought I'd, I had a good chance of getting it. And we talked about it, and I said, no, I think I'm going to take the foreign affairs job. And he said, okay, well, if you do, here's a manuscript I've been working on. Uh, tell me what you think of it anyway. If you think it's, it's something foreign affairs would be will, will interested in publishing, uh, let me know. So I went home and read it, and it was The Clash of Civilizations. And I went back to him and said, I think we would love to publish it. And it was actually the first issue that I edited at Foreign Affairs. I made that really the first ever cover essay at Foreign Affairs. We you know, put it in big bold type uh, above everything else in a way that signaled we thought it was very important. So I think it's a very powerful, interesting set of ideas that have in many ways been very prescient. It has its flaws. So the basic thesis of the Clash of Civilizations, which I think is true, was that at the end of the Cold War, as the Cold War waned, the dominant motivating force of the Cold War had been political ideology. It had been the great dividing line. So whether you were communist or capitalist, whether you were communist or democratic, whether you were part of the American sphere or the Soviet sphere, that was really how you figured out international politics, you figured out the fault lines of the world, and that that was, that was obviously over. This was 1992, 93 um, that, that we published. I think it was 93, uh, January 93. The new fault line, he argued, was this thing he called civilizations. But at the heart of civilizations was religion. And his argument was that human beings have lost the, the, their identity as ideological beings, and states have lost their identity as ideological beings, you know, are they in the, the East camp or the, the, or the West camp. So they are regaining or, re, or, or, or re, uh, finding again their identity, uh, as, which is based on culture, on civilization, and on religion. I think that piece of it is incredibly powerful. And I think one only has to look at, you know, the, the return of these ideas of culture and religion, not just in the Middle East, but in, you know, places like India and Russia, um, even a place like Israel has become, you know, more deeply conscious uh, of its religion. Sometimes it takes the form more of culture than of religion, but in many cases, religion is at its heart. So I think that piece of it, Sam, really powerfully and early on identified, um, and he identified that there was a particular problem in the world of Islam, um, which I think, again, has proved to be you know, very powerful and prescient. Where I think he went wrong was he got very enamored with the idea of the civilizations and the clash of civilizations. And so he had this, he imagined this a world in which Western civilization was going to clash with Chinese civilization and Islamic civilization. And he almost viewed them as in big interacting, you know, kind of uh, billiard balls on a, on a global uh, a billiard table. But in fact, what we discover is, you know, the world is very messy there. You know, where does Latin America fit into that, that framework? How do you deal with the fact that the big conflicts of the world are really mostly within the world of Islam, you know, between the Shiites and the Sunnis, between the moderates and the radicals? In fact, you know, I think that the, the, the last five years, if you look at the number of people who've been killed by Islamic terrorism, 95, 98% of them have been Muslims, you know, Muslims killing each other. So he got too enamored with this idea of civilizations and the idea that they cohere. Uh, and so I think that part of it has never really worked. You know, if you're, you, 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 you don't notice that, like Saddam Hussein, when he invaded Kuwait, didn't notice that they were both Arab, both Muslim, both Sunni countries, that he was, there, there was, that was old fashioned geopolitics. So that piece of it, I don't think has worked as well. But the, the core insight, I, I still uh, think that it's important to remember, in 1992, not a lot of people were saying the next big source of identity, conflict, power is, is going to be culture and identity. Uh, and he, and he, got, he got that exactly right. Yeah, yeah. Well, we'll talk about Islam, and hopefully I'll, I'll ask you a few questions about China as well, and I think Huntington might come back in, in uh, about half an hour or so. But now, how do you view yourself politically at this moment? How would you describe your, your political biases such as they are? Oh, you know, I, I think of myself sort of fundamentally as um, a classical liberal, somebody who looks at the 19th century tradition of 
liberals, by which I mean people who were dedicated to the idea of human liberty, the preservation of liberty, free speech, free thought. But like many of those people, I think the world, you, you learn as you go along, as it were. And I think that I've, you know, I'm, I would describe myself as a kind of moderate or reformed classical liberal, by which I mean I can see that, uh, that, that there are excesses within capitalism, which does not allow, allow for a pure free market, that a pure free market ends up often being the rule of the strong or the well-connected, uh, you know, that the game is in some ways rigged and that uh, people don't have perfect information or perfect knowledge, so you have to, you have to play a role there. Uh, I think that you know, traditional liberals had too uh, benign a view of international conflict. You know, they tended to all believe that if everybody just became democratic, that we would all live in peace for the rest of our lives. And I think this power matters, geopolitics matters, geography matters. So, you know, where does that place me in today's political spectrum? When I was in college, I was, I was very enamored of Reagan. I, I was kind of a right winger. I liked, uh, I think part of it was I grew up in India. And I was, I came from a, essentially a socialist country. Uh, and I liked Reagan's emphasis on freedom and free markets. I liked his frank talk about the Soviet Union as an evil empire, which I liked. I never bought the, the social conservative agenda. I've always been a social liberal. And then I found that the, it, it, to my mind, the, the Republican Party went right and right and right and right after Reagan. And, and, you know, particularly, I remember the Clinton years where, you know, they were you know, on this kind of insane crusade to impeach uh, Clinton. And the Democratic Party had moved to the center. So I found a lot that I liked among liberal Republicans and conservative Democrats. And I would say politically, that's sort of still where I am. I, I, I tend to think I didn't move as much as the country moved. Uh, but my overall effort has always been to try to look at every issue, uh, you know, on its own merits. So I, I try not to start with the assumption, if the Republicans propose this, it must be a bad idea. If the Democrats propose it, it must be a good idea. I try to look at, you know, these things just literally, are they, do they make sense? So Trump just proposed the privatizing the FAA, the, 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 you know, the airline traffic control. And it's sort of essentially been, been dead on arrival uh, on the left. So I just kind of looked at it and I came to the conclusion, it's actually a pretty good idea. It, you have to be structured carefully, but they did it in Canada, which is not exactly a bastion of crazy libertarian ideas. And, uh, and it seems to be working pretty well. And it allows for the kind of technological upgrade that we really need. So, you know, I, I, I know that's a very small bore uh, one, but I was struck by how even that got subsumed with the kind of partisanship that we have now, where nothing is viewed on its own terms. Yeah, well, I want to talk about partisanship. I, you, you've written about it recently, and I want to attempt, however vainly, to inoculate our audience against the sense that we are merely expressing partisanship when we talk about Trump, as we inevitably will. Now, I, I, I don't know if you've listened to any of my podcasts where I've spoken about Trump, but I have now, it has to be at least 10 hours of me railing against the president, I mean, both you know, as a candidate and now as a president. And I've had people like David Frum and Ann Applebaum and Andrew Sullivan uh, and Juliet Kayyem and pe people who, who are quite critical of and worried about Trump in the Oval Office. And we have just gone to town on him ad nauseum. And this very much to the consternation of some significant percentage of my audience. I actually don't know how large a percentage. It's a very vocal minority. But every time I've done this, and, and more and more, I have tried to make it very clear that partisanship is not the motivation here. And there are easy ways to see this. It's, it's hard for people to really take these facts on board. But one point I now often make is that anything I or my guest says in this context, which seems to be hoping for impeachment, is, as a matter of fact, a hope for a President Mike Pence. Now, you know, Mike Pence is not someone who I would ever have thought I would want in the Oval Office, but insofar as I go down the road of, of impeachment, that's the goal. Hillary Clinton is no longer on the menu, as should be clear. And also, it, it should be clear that most of the guests, virtually all of the guests I've had talk critically about Trump, have been Republicans for the most part their entire lives, or at the very least center-right. It's not a Bernie Sanders-style critique of, of Trumpism. 
So in any case, I, I want us to talk about Trump, or I don't think we're going to spend a, a lot of time on his flaws because I don't, I don't think there are so many surprises there. But let's begin with this issue of partisanship and how it has seemingly increased at this moment for us and how it, it's made talking about political reality and just terrestrial reality, just talking about facts, talking about climate change, talking about, in the example you just raised, whether privatizing the FAA could be a good idea or not. It's made it impossible to do that without this toxic miasma of, of partisanship and tribalism seemingly subsuming everything. So before we jump right into, into Trump and, and what concerns you there, talk a little bit about partisanship in, in the current moment. I think the most worrying thing uh, about where we are politically is, is the, what seemed to be the 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 core of uh, of how we have now begun to define ourselves as political beings. So again, if you go back to that Huntington uh, distinction, it, it it did used to be it seemed to be that people viewed themselves more in ideological terms, liberal, conservative. The, the the issues were really essentially around, you know, the kind of the role of the state in our lives. Um, so you are left of center or right of center, depending on largely on your view of the role of the, the state in our in the economic life of of, of the nation. And that divide was very important, but it was one that you could talk about, you could argue about, you could negotiate over, and you could split differences. You know, there was, you wanted to spend more money, I wanted to spend less. Well, there's a, there was a number in the middle. What has happened, and there's very good research from uh, the, uh, Harvard's Kennedy School, uh, this woman Pippa Norris and uh, Ronald, Roland Inglehart have done, which shows that people, about the 1980s, this began to happen in significant numbers, started to define themselves not by the, by, on over economic issues, but over cultural issues. They, you know, they, they, their identity derived not from their economic class, but from national origin, race, gender, sexual orientation. And so we, we've organized ourselves almost more into tribes. And those, those identities are more ascriptive identities. They are given identities. And so the problem with that is it's very hard to negotiate or to compromise or to even talk about these issues. It's, you know, it's, it seems as though you are, one person is assaulting the other side's identity. They're looking down on, they view one side or the other as immoral. And all the battle line issues tend to be like that, you know, abortion, gay rights, even things like immigration is really a debate over national identity. And so it's not easy to compromise. And what that has done is it's made it impossible for there to be that open common space. I mean, the the liberal tradition, and now again, I just mean liberal, small l, meaning really the democratic tradition, assumes you can have debates because there are common facts to which we have access. We are assuming, you know, each side is amenable to changing their views. But we have become in, in America more like Sunnis and Shiites. You know, we're, we're, we're like, you, you, you can't really have a debate because one side views the other as then insulting them. And then, uh, and there's no compromise possible because you'd be surrendering your very identity to this other side. Each side, in a sense, thinks that to let the other one win would be to dramatically change our core conception of what the country is. Now, if we are locked in that kind of a, a, a debate, it's not even a debate into a, a, a kind of a, a cultural contest, conflict, it makes one despair at the prospects of liberal democracy, which does depend on reasoned debate with common facts. This is what has worried me most about Trump. It's this erosion of the norm around facts. This is what's been so destabilizing about him and his surrogates. Obviously, the, the, the people like Kellyanne Conway or Sean Spicer, who will get on television and lie in a way that is so childlike. I mean, it's the way that Trump lies. There's no pretense of making your lies square with common reality so that it's just this it's really an appeal to tribalism, I think. It's really, and it's appeal to people saying, don't forget, we're a team and those guys are bad. And, you know, it's, as you're right, they don't even pretend to have a very good explanation or answer. It's just an appeal to tribalism. In this case, it's hard for me to understand what the tribe is, because it's not, it's not a religious tribe, although some numbers of religious people have gotten behind Trump. It's not an establishment Republican tribe. It doesn't even seem, I mean, all of the policies to which they seem to have been committed in the campaign, any one or a collection of them seem fungible. Like if when Trump goes back on a promise 
people seem to sort of just shrug and say, well, you know, of course he was going to go back on a promise. That was just an opening negotiation gambit. I don't know what the value is to which everyone is captive here, apart from just the the theater of it. The fact that this is good television or that he has destabilized the system in a way that continues to be entertaining. There's a kind of like, it's almost like a a nihilistic attitude with respect to the status quo. People just want to see this wrecking ball swing freely through the system. Do you have any more insight as to what you think is going on there? Because I, I can't get people to make reasonable noises in defense of Trump when he either does something crazy and impulsive on, on his side or even just reneges on a promise that yesterday his fans or supporters said was important to them. Well, I think you're. I think you're absolutely right. But but and I, the only thing I would amend is you keep saying p- people support him. So we know now a lot about the people who support him. And now I'm not talking about the people who voted for him. Republicans are very loyal. He got basically the same percentage of Republican support as Romney did. We really have become two teams. But if you look at his core support, the 35 percent approval rating he has now, those people are overwhelmingly non-college educated white. And what Trump, you know, what the tribe is a kind of white working class or non-college educated, non-urban group that believes that they have been passed by, despised, condescended to, overlooked, uh, that, they, that the, the, you know, that the, that the America they see is one that is, uh, that is filled with uppity working women and and minorities who may be getting ahead because of affirmative action and immigrants who are coming in and technologists and financiers who have rigged the the system of meritocracy that series of cultural resentments uh is very powerful and very real there's you know there are some real economic bases for it there are some you know some of it is just stoking uh, prejudice it's some weird combination of all that but that's, it seems to me, the core. And, and those are the people Trump really knows how to, how to play with and how Steve Bannon knows how to play with. So I don't think it's completely, you know, it's, it's not just all the theater and the celebrity. There, there is a very, there's a real core here, which is, you know, about more about social class than we like to talk about in America. Some of it to do with race, some of it to do with religion. But it's this whole combination of, of, of feelings. There's, and you see something similar in, in Britain with the pro-Brexit, anti-Brexit. Again, you found that education and urban-rural were the two big divides. And it is, when you talk to these people, as I have, um, we're doing a, a, um, a documentary called Why Trump Won. And what's interesting, what's really you sense is the feeling of resentment, the feeling that they have been condescended to the feeling that they have been, you know, that the whole country is being run by other people. How do you feel that journalism is faring now in the aftermath, in the era of fake news? I I think it's pretty plain to see that journalism was culpable for treating the the election and the, the whole campaign season as a horse race and giving Trump, I don't know, it's been estimated like more than a billion dollars free television. But it seems to me that in the aftermath, the attitude of journalism has changed noticeably. But how do you how do you think we're faring now? Um, so for, first, on the on the first point, I have to I have to defend CNN a little bit in the sense that you know people forget uh, that Trump very early on became the Republican frontrunner in the polls. Um, there were a bunch of people like Nate Silver at at uh, five thirty eight and pundits who were saying, "Don't pay any attention to the polls because the polls don't." Uh, actually predict who's going to get the nomination. It's actually money and it's organization and endorsements. But Trump, was, was, was remarkably early on, became the dominant figure in the polls. So that's number one. He was the Republican frontrunner. And two, he started very early on to say completely outrageous things and propose completely outrageous policies that nobody had ever proposed. I mean, he was proposing you know, mass deportations of 11 million people. He was talking about building a wall. He spoke sort of favorably of the internment of the Japanese Americans. Then he comes up with the Muslim ban. So that's news. You know, you may not like it, but you have the Republican frontrunner uh, proposing stuff that no presidential candidate has proposed in 75 years. And, you you know, we can't pretend it, it, it wasn't news. Now, all that said, I agree with, I think, what you're saying, which is that we, we got caught up in the theater of it. 
And look, just remember the print media, the, the media, the television media in particular, is not a is not a nonprofit charity. If we are putting something on, chances are you want to see it. Uh, it's on because it, there is a public appetite for it, and it's a very competitive industry. If you don't do it, somebody else will do it. So that that would be my defense uh, of the of the media. But on your larger question, look, I do think now the media. If you want to look for some good news. I would say the the resilience of the American system has been somewhat satisfying to me to watch, which is the courts are functioning well and are not being cowed, despite the fact that you have a president who, in an unprecedented way, is attacking the judiciary and often actually attacking judges by name, which I really don't think has happened. The non-political bureaucrats that make up the kind of, uh, you know, the heart and soul of, of, of government, for whether it's the FBI, the Justice Department, they are holding up pretty well. They have not been intimidated. Um, and the media is rising to the occasion. I think you're seeing a renaissance of real investigative journalism. You're seeing people commentary. You know, I think conservative intellectuals, for example, you mentioned a few like David Frum, uh, have really risen to the occasion, even though it has cost them. I mean, George Will was, as far as I can tell, essentially fired from, from Fox because he was outspokenly anti-Trump. Uh, and I think that that piece of it uh, the media, I think, has handled pretty well. There is a problem with, on the Trump phenomenon. So, so the way I think about it, there are three sort of baskets of things you're trying to, I at least am trying to figure out. One is, what are the things Trump is actually proposing and how do you evaluate them? I said, you know, like the FAA thing or whether it's the tax policy. And, you know, I think you have to try to evaluate the, those fairly by saying, are they good? Are they bad? Are they? A lot of what he proposes is very weird, haphazard badly thought through, but you still have to ask yourself, okay, but, you know, is this, is this, if it were properly laid out, would this, would this be a good idea or a bad idea? So there's that one cluster of things, and a lot of it is surprisingly not very populist. It's actually pretty standard, fair, Republican uh, stuff. The second is the circus of Donald Trump, the sheer kind of weird, biz, you know, bizarro way in which he operates, the the vulgarity, the personal attacks, uh, you know, and that has a kind of theatric, a kind of seductive theatrical aspect to it. But then there's the third part, which you focused a lot on, which I think is the most important part. And unfortunately, it is the fact that Trump is, in many of his actions and rhetoric, a danger to American democracy. Uh, and, you know, when, you, when, when I talk about the third, I try not to forget the first and the second but it does overwhelm because the fact that you have a president who is willing to routinely do things like attack the, the independence of the judiciary, attack the free press, talk about prosecuting journalists, talk about maybe we should be changing the protections that journalists uh, and the free uh, press have, clearly talking to various members of the investigative branches of the federal government and trying to get them to bend to his will you know, whether or not it constitutes obstruction of justice, all of which is, strikes me, patently, obviously, dangerous for democracy, dangerous for liberal democracy to have a president, you know, having nine meetings with the director of the FBI in the hundred days he was in office when Obama had two meetings with that same director in the, you know, six years that they, were, they overlapped. It tells you something, and it's, doesn't, and it's, it's not something pretty about America. So how do you talk about that third cluster of events in a way that, uh, that, that doesn't sort of overwhelm everything. That's, that's been one of my challenges. It's a real challenge because the moment you begin talking about it, honestly, you begin to sound like one of the, the hyper-partisans we just complained about, where you're, you're calling the other side dangerous or immoral or un-American. And it seems like these are not the kinds of claims about the other side that seem open for compromise or negotiation or a meet-in-the-middle approach, because we are talking about someone who is undermining the norms of our democracy, as you say, and that is dangerous. And yet anyone who's just either not paying attention or on the other side understandably thinks it's dangerous to talk about the president this way. It's hyper-partisan to talk about the president this way. But you can only walk on eggshells for so long here before you have to concede that he is not a normal person in the role of the president. He is someone who is not observing the most 
basic criteria for being informed, caring about whether or not he's informed, to take one thread among a dozen we could take here. But however the, the Russian hacking investigation comes out and whether collusion between the Trump campaign or Trump himself and the Russians can be proved or not, leave all of that to one side. What is unambiguously so is that we have a hostile foreign power that worked mightily hard to undermine our democracy. And we have a president who has either denied that to be so or has more or less ignored it and done nothing to really get to the bottom of it simply because he's concerned about how it makes his electoral victory look. And he's never said a bad word about Putin, right, who's you know, someone who has his political foes and, and the occasional journalist locked up or killed. If he had done nothing else wrong in his career as president, those facts alone are so alarming that we are, we're, we're nowhere near normal here. And so to talk about this in, in terms this stark is not yet another example of hyperpartisan demagoguery. Yeah, it's, it's a very, very interesting point, which is how do you convey that this really is, um, this is different, this is not normal, this is, the, these are, this is a violation of, of standards, this is not uh, within the historical range. I mean, if you, you know, one of the ones I think we don't pay enough attention to is you have the President of the United States who is essentially um, in, in no significant way uh, disassociated himself from his m- various uh, many, many, many commercial enterprises, uh, continues to benefit from them, and is actively promoting many of the those commercial enterprises. We now have, you know, we have now dollar and cent figures on the 30, 20, 30, 40 percent rises in revenues for all these clubs that he keeps attending, that he keeps going to. You know, what he's in effect doing is essentially commercial advertising for Mar-a-Lago and for the Bedminster Club and things like that. We have no idea what the, the nature of his meetings with foreign uh, uh, leaders is, but what we do know is, again, he has not disassociated himself from much of the, the kind of licensing operation that takes place. The Chinese award 35 trademarks in one day to him, 15 to his, uh, to his daughter. To talk about all this is not to, you know, to, be, to be partisan. It is to say this is really something Mitt Romney and John McCain uh, and, and George W. Bush and George H. W. Bush did not do, would never have dreamed of doing, uh, and is something that, you know, we have to talk about because this is how a, you know, this is how a banana republic runs. And we don't want to adopt those. We don't want to define these standards down so much that they go away. You know, part of what I think I'm in the job of is the kind of preservation job. That is the preservation of these norms of liberal democracy, because I don't want to create a situation where we get so used to it that the next guy who comes around says, oh, yeah, you know, I don't need to resign from any of my companies. I don't need to uh, release my tax returns. I don't need to do any of this. And, I, you know, my, my wife and my daughter and uh, son-in-law can be my principal advisors. No, no, no. We have to make sure that Trump is an aberration, not the beginning of some kind of, you know, kind of uh, caudismo rule in the United States. Now, is there any benign explanation of all of this? Take the two pieces that you and I have put in play here, and again, there's there are many more pieces we could talk about. But just take two things: the fact that he still has all of his business dealings up and running, whether he's personally paying attention to them or not, and the fact that he has never said a bad word about Putin. Is there a a fundamentally benign explanation of all that? You know, the one that that I wonder about sometimes is the 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 the. Eco, the a business side, I can't quite see the benign explanation because, you, you, you know, there are many easy ways. George W. Bush's uh, ethics lawyer outlined how he could put stuff in a blind trust. I mean, there, were, there are things you could do, and clearly they're consciously not doing them. On the Russia thing, I think the odd thing is I can imagine a benign explanation involving collusion, which is to say that Trump ran a very disorganized, chaotic, and kind of corrupt campaign, by which I mean uh, it was a crazy mom-and-pop fly-by-night operation. He couldn't get any of the big consultants. Remember, there were 15, 16 other candidates. That all the serious consultants had gone to them. So he's dealing with the, the, the riffraff of the Republican world, and he's dealing with a lot of unsavory characters. 
and they're running, they're kind of doing a, almost a freelance operation. And in that context, the Russians are trying to penetrate, and, and maybe his guys played footsie with the Russians, but he didn't know about it. I think that's a, bit, that's a perfectly plausible, benign explanation on the collusion part. The part I don't understand, and for which it's harder to find a benign explanation, is what you've pointed out a few times, which is really the central puzzle. Donald Trump has said for almost all his life, that he thinks that the one thing that he's sure about is that the rest of the world is constantly screwing the United States, and we need to get tough on all these SOBs. And, you know, he said that from the 1980s when he was talking about the Japanese and the NATO allies, and then he talked about the Chinese and how they were raping our country, and how Saudi Arabia was a country that we had to pull the rug from under. Everybody, except the Russians. He has only said nice things about Putin, only said nice things about how wouldn't it be great if we could get on with the Russians. Now, you know, there's a, there is a school of thought that feels that. It tends to come more from the, the, the kind of hard left uh, than, than from anywhere else uh, in historical terms. But it really makes no sense given Trump's worldview. So that, to me, is in a, in a way the central intellectual puzzle that leads me to think maybe there is something going on here because why is he so consistently benign in his reading of everything Putin. I mean, you know, even that meeting um, in, with the Russian ambassador and foreign minister in the, in the White House, it was so much more pally than anything we've seen. The, the contacts that, that took place with, in, during the campaign, perfectly fine if they were what they say they were. But what I'm struck by is we have no record of any such co- of conversations with the French ambassador, the German ambassador, the British ambassador, the Chinese ambassador, you know. So what is going on with Russia is, I think, is a fair question to which uh, some of Trump's own rhetoric points you. So, Fareed, I want to switch gears here and talk about Islam and um, you know, the current challenge in even talking about it and the role it's playing in creating so much chaos in the world, and as you rightly pointed out, mostly for Muslims. You and I have disagreed both in public and in private about how to talk about the problem of Islamic extremism. So I want to see if we can make a little progress on this disagreement here. And so let's just come to it in a kind of stepwise fashion. First, I noticed that recently you've written that you are a Muslim, but you're not a practicing one. And I think that was very much in response to the Trump travel ban, I believe, that you felt that you needed to assert your Muslim identity. What does that mean? What does it mean to be a Muslim, but not a practicing one to you? Well, you put it exactly right. I felt as though I'm, I'm, not a practicing Muslim. I'm not religious. I haven't been inside a mosque except as a tourist for 35 years. But um, I was raised as one. My parents were both believing Muslims in India, which is you know has a very secular and moderate form of Islam uh, by and large. But when Trump then you know th- this is during the campaign when he said you know a total and complete ban on all Muslims initially not even making a distinction between American citizens and, and, and non-citizens, I felt like um, it was one of those moments where I could approach the subject completely analytically, but I also had built up a certain credibility over the years in terms of my voice and my, my, my uh, views. And the, to the extent that there were going to be people who would succumb to this kind of stereotyping of an entire vast group of people, I owed it to myself intellectually in terms of the, just my integrity to not try to duck the issue and to, not, and to, and to just stand up and be counted. You know, I remember, uh, it was a, and it was an awkward thing because I don't really think of myself in particularly, I don't think any of my views uh, are informed deeply by the fact that I'm a Muslim. I, I, I think that the knowledge I have and that, the, you know, I know that world well uh, informs it, I, just as having grown up in India does. But it's awkward because you, you know that it's going to brand you in a particular way. And I knew that most of my readers and viewers probably didn't know uh, that I was one because I've never been somebody to play the identity card. I've, you know, in 20 years of commentary, I've almost never said as a, you know, Indian or immigrant or person of color, I try to give you my arguments as best I can and hope that, that I can, through, through reason and evidence, kind of persuade you. But this felt a little bit like, you know, in a very small way, and I don't mean to over, overdraw the comparison, but there were a lot of assimilated Jews in Germany in the early 1930s. And when the 
that when the, the, the discrimination started to ramp up, uh, you know, there was a choice you faced. Do you stand up and be counted? Or do you pretend, you know, do not pretend, do you, do, you, uh, do you kind of assert the reality that you're actually not very Jewish? You're an assimilated German. You have no particular ties to that community. You have no... And, you know, so I felt a little bit like that. And I thought, look, at the end of the day, I need to be, I need to take this, this credibility I have and, and say to people, you know, if you think this way about Muslims, just keep in mind, there are a whole bunch of people and they are very different. And I happen to have grown up in that tradition as well. So I, I still grapple with it because I don't, I really don't like identity politics, but I felt like not doing so somehow felt to me cowardly. Yeah, that's interesting because it, it's especially awkward to assert your identity as a Muslim if you're a non-believer. Actually, I have a, a friend, uh, Ali Rizvi, who just wrote a book titled The Atheist Muslim, as though you could be an atheist Muslim. There are people who, are, who used to be religious, who are Muslims, who lose their faith, but rather than simply say that they're ex-Muslims or no, lo no longer Muslims, he is carving out a space for asserting that you are an atheist Muslim. But here's why I did it. Why I did it, uh, Sam, was, I suppose, in a way, a, a Jewish friend of mine said to me, yeah, I'm an atheist too, but you know what? When they come to round up the Jews, they're not going to care. And, and I think, in a sense, that was partly what I was thinking about, you know, your friend or me. Whatever we might say, if they, <laughs> you know, if they decide they're going to create a Muslim registry, I, I, they're not going to let me put my hand up and say, oh, but by the way, I actually have very serious doubts about whether or not the Quran is, in fact, the spoken word you know, the, of God. They're going to say, thank you very much. Give us your name and social security number. Despite what I feel about identity politics and despite what you might imagine I feel about or what you know I feel about Islam as a set of ideas, I actually appreciate that you did that. And I think, I think you're right to view that as an appropriate expression of solidarity with the, the Muslim community. And I think, frankly, the norm of having people who identify as being Muslim but who are not religious, I think that's a norm that we want advertised as much as possible, because that, frankly, just does not seem like an option, given the views about apostasy under Islam. It just seems like you are you're increasing your risk within the Muslim community by saying, I'm Muslim, but I don't believe X, Y, and Z. Yeah, I, I actually had a funny mini, mini uh, controversy of exactly the kind you're describing play out. My Wikipedia entry pointed out correctly that for that I was at one point the wine critic for Slate magazine. <laughs> I did it for one year, uh, many, many years ago, uh, and uh, I stopped doing it. I, I love wine, and I know a lot about it, and Mike Kinsley, the editor, had asked me if I would uh, you know, write about something, anything for them, and so I tried it and decided I didn't want to spend my time researching about wine. But it became this thing which on the Wikipedia notes, because people kept putting it in saying, you know, as a sign of his blatant disrespect and disregard for Islam, you know, Zakaria openly advocates the consumption of alcohol as the wine critic of Sayyidada. And, and it would, you know, it would be like I, I, line number seven on my, in my biography, and then somebody would take it out and then would get reinstated. And I was just so fascinated by the drama. And back in the notes, you could see these, you know, fanatical uh, religious zealots who wanted to use that one little thing that, you know, 25 years ago, I was a wine, a wine critic for state as a way to discredit me. So you're exactly right that I think, I, I think it would be a much better thing for, for the, the Muslim community if you could have the, the same kind of varieties of belief that increasingly you, you have in every other community. Or even just a clear case of non-belief, but still a cultural attachment to the traditions. So for instance, like I could never convert to your style of being a Muslim because I haven't had that experience. I didn't grow up in India. I, I don't have Muslim relatives. I don't have any of the cultural points of contact in my, my life, but I could convert to ISIS's style of Islam in the next five minutes if only I believed the doctrines they say I have to believe, and, and then I, and I profess that belief. So there are two levels here, there, and what you're describing is very much, as you said, like the way many secular Jews live. Their Judaism is the touchstone for them, but it's not religious. 
they're identified with the culture of Judaism and they've they've grown up surrounded by other Jews, but they're not to say that they're Jewish does not make any propositional claim about what they believe happens after death or who they think is running the universe or anything else that might be in the Bible. Exactly. I think I think Jews have really um mastered the ability to uh, to accept uh, to to almost celebrate the idea that you can believe anything and still be uh, still be a Jew. You don't have to believe in God, you don't have to believe I mean there's a, the, the kind of the ability to absorb any serious intellectual uh, uh, outlook on life and still be Jewish is it's actually one of the most uh, extraordinary things about the Jewish um, community and faith. Now, this leads to a lot of confusion, however, because people who have this attitude toward their religion, in my experience, tend to assume that other people have this attitude as well. And when they claim not to have this attitude, and when even they blow themselves up, having professed their certainty that they're going to get into paradise, secular, assimilated, overeducated people tend to think that the, that the religious extremists are just bluffing, you know, that they're, they're, they're not being motivated by what they say they're motivated by. They're, they're, they're not as religious as they claim. They're not as certain of paradise as they claim. Again, this, I've encountered this skepticism even on the subject of, of suicide bombings. And therefore, there must be other explanations for this behavior. And I want to talk about this a little bit. I guess let's begin by just talking about this narrow question on which you and I seemingly have had a difference of opinion in the past, which is you've argued that it doesn't matter what we call the ideology that's animating groups like ISIS and al-Qaeda. And that you, I think you've said that it's, you think it's counterproductive to focus on the link between religious doctrines and terrorism or jihadism. And I think you think I have erred on the side of emphasizing those links. And, and you know, when I was on your show, you said, well, look, you're, you're, just, you're not telling the world that al-Qaeda has it right. You're, you're endorsing al-Qaeda's view of Islam, the subtext being that that was an incredibly unproductive thing to be doing. Let's talk about that. How, how would you describe this disagreement. Sure, sure. And I appreciate your being um, uh, so forthright and, and willing to have the, the conversation. Uh, here, here's what I worry about. I, what I worry about, uh, to be clear, I've called this thing radical Islamic terrorism from, I think, the, the first column I wrote up after 9-11, I called it radical Islamic terrorism. So I have no problem with the phrase. My problem is, as you put it correctly, which is if, if you draw too close a link to Islam, the religion, and these acts of terror, these acts of violence, these acts of jihad, and say that it is kind of inherent in the religion, that the religion has within it these texts that celebrate violence, that, that, that it is in, its, in, in a way a violent religion. My problem with it is this. Firstly, it's sort of ahistorical, because the truth of the matter is Islam has been around for 14 centuries. There have been periods when you've had a lot of suicide bombers, but there have been periods where you haven't. There have been periods where there has been a lot of conflict and, cla and clashes with the, with the West. There have been periods where they, they haven't. There have been periods three, four hundred years under the Ottoman Empire where minorities were treated a lot better than under the, the West. I'm not actually making the case that in, uh, Islam has you know, a shining track record. What I'm saying is there's variation, and that variation has to do with political, economic, social circumstances. If you lose sight of that and you, and you simply talk about the religion and the text, the danger is that for a lot of people, it will sound like you're saying Islam is inherently and irretrievably violent. And there's two problems with that. You'll feed a lot of uh, prejudice and hate. You will convince a lot of Muslims that you're essentially, you're branding them and their religion as kind of irretrievably and irremediably violent. Um, and so, as I say, the historical part makes me feel it's not quite right. It doesn't get at the richness uh, of human experience uh, where Islam has had periods of violence and periods of peace. But more importantly, it's profoundly unhelpful because you're, you're going to feed an enormous amount of, of, of hatred. You're going to feed a sense of exclusion and marginalization uh, in, the, in the Muslim community. And so if you think it gets at some core, deep intellectual truth, maybe it's worth the price. But you better be damn sure you're you're getting at something like that because 
you're certainly doing something that is going to be profoundly unhelpful on the ground. And I say this, as I say, having lived in Muslim communities, you know, one of the things people make the mistake of doing is to think that Muslims, that it's, that to talk about things like this is not racist because Islam is a religion, not a race. I get the point, but you know, for the 1.695 billion Muslims out of the 1.7 or whatever it is, 99.999% of Muslims, they're just Muslim because their parents were Muslim, because they grew up Muslim. They're, they, you know, it's as much a, 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 an, ascriptive cho- a, a, an ascriptive feature of their life as race. They didn't sit down and say, let me do a comparative and evaluation of the Bible, the Torah, and, and the Quran, and I've chosen Islam. They're just Muslim. So when you attack their religion as being inherently violent, to them, it's an assault on them. And if you seek, as I believe you genuinely do, uh, the reform of the religion, which you and I 100% agree on, my point is you're choosing to do so in a way that's not really that intellectually rigorous, that's kind of reductionist and simplified, and you're doing it in a way that's incredibly harmful on the ground. So why do it? Okay, well, so, so let me just take a couple of minutes to tell you why I think we should do it. First, let's leave history aside for the moment, because I think you can tell the, the story of the history two different ways, and, and one is more plausible than, and, and more rigorous than the others. I think, to come back to Huntington for a second, I think you know, his, his off-quoted line, which I think was in his book, I don't actually recall reading it in his book, but the, 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 his line about Islam having bloody borders does account for a fair amount in that much of the peace you can ascribe to you know, life under Islam is true for two reasons. It's true during periods where you have a truly homogeneous Muslim society that isn't having to play well with others because there are no others to which it's coming into contact, uh, or you have you know pe- you have people you know the the, the dimmi living under the, under them fully subjugated. So that that I think is a bit of an optical illusion. I mean we're living in a pluralistic world now, and you have to play well with others. Uh, and then there's also just the fact that much of the good things said about medieval Islam are said by comparison with the horrors of medieval Christianity. But that's the only compa- the only relevant comparison is how how other human be- you know how other societies were organized. You're not going to get me to defend medieval Christianity. I'm just saying that I think it's useful to just we're not going to get a lot of advantage debating the history. I think we should just talk about the facts on the ground in the 21st century. And I think we have to talk about these facts totally honestly. The advantage of doing this is that, one, just reality is on your side. I mean, if you're making your best effort to speak about facts, you're, you're staying in touch with those facts, and you're, you're obliging other people to stay in touch with those facts. And the crucial facts about Islam at this moment is that more than any other religion on earth, it is in dire need of reform. Some of the reasons for this are superficial. I mean, they're just accidents of history, and they don't run very deep into doctrine, but some are deep, and they, and they have to do with, with ways that, that Islam is actually different from other religions with respect to specific doctrines. And it will be different in a thousand years if Muslims don't change their approach to these specific theological questions. And so the first thing to admit is that Islam is presenting a range of problems to us that Anglicanism and Mormonism and even Scientology don't. And as you said at the beginning of this conversation, the burden of these problems is felt most acutely by Muslims themselves, right? So the the burden of Sunni extremism, for example, is felt most acutely by Shia and Ahmadis and people who are getting their mosques blown up and their wedding parties blown up in places like Pakistan. And other other Sunnis. I mean, you know, all the Sunni, all the women in in these, in Saudi Arabia. Absolutely. So, so, I mean, that, that fact is never far from my mind when I'm, when I'm criticizing these ideas. We have to admit, again, just talking honestly about what's happening now, much of this insanity has nothing to do with U.S. foreign policy or Israel or anything but religious sectarianism and the doctrines surrounding things like jihad and apostasy and martyrdom and takfirism and, and blasphemy. And here's, a, here's a, another piece here, which I think you have been missing, which is to speak honestly about this. I mean, to put the onus especially on Islam and the need for reform there, right? To not immediately move to, well, Christianity has its people who blow up abortionists, for instance, once every decade and a half. 
But to keep the focus on Islam empowers the Muslims in the Muslim world who are the, the most common victims. And so, I mean, to talk about what my friend Majid Nawaz describes as the minorities within the minority, the gays and the free thinkers and the apostates and the liberals like yourself and the, and the, the people who are uniquely vulnerable within the Muslim community. And, and so to acknowledge that Islam imposes a, a credible threat of violence toward apostates, which is just a fact the world over, is to then acknowledge that ex-Muslims, even ex-Muslims living in Manhattan or Beverly Hills, very often have safety concerns that ex-Mormons and even ex-Scientologists don't. I mean, if, if, you know, if Leah Remini, the, the, the actress, you know, who just famously left Scientology and now has a show you know, criticizing the, the treatment of, of, of people in, in the cult, if she was leaving a cult where there was an explicit doctrine that apostates should be killed, if we have L. Ron Hubbard saying this again and again, and Scientologists had a history of reliably killing people who had left their group, she would be in a very different situation, and, and her, her security concerns would be excruciating. And that's the situation that many ex-Muslims are in. I, I, mean, I hear from ex-Muslims who are afraid that members of their family will kill them, right? And this is something that to just say, well, all religions have their extremists is a way of just not actually responding to that, to that difference. But I've never, I've never said that, uh, to be fair, Sam. I've never been one of these people who said, well, you know, there's, there was Timothy McVeigh and all that. I've always said Islam has a, spe a specific problem. As I said to you, Huntington, you know, was right when he talked about how Islam, you know, the problem was largest in the world of Islam. Here's the part that I'm trying to get at, which is when I wrote the, the, my essay, Why They Hate Us, it was, it was two weeks after 9-11, trying to explain Islamic, you know, the 9-11 attacks. And my whole point was that it didn't have much to do with American foreign policy. It didn't have to do with Israel. It had to do with the breakdown of Arab societies, the stagnation politically, economically, that then led to the rise of this alternative, this, this violent opposition, uh, you know, which, which first became Islamic fundamentalism, then became morphed into jihad. And the reason I focus on that is twofold. One is historically, it really is true. I have to, I have to tell you, I do contest what you're saying. In the 1950s, if you were to have looked at the world and said, what, what culture or, you know, is, is, is producing the most violence in the world, nobody would have come up with Islam. Um, I mean, if you looked at the Middle East versus uh, East Asia with all the Maoist guerrilla movements, I mean, India had 10% of India was being racked by, by violence of, from Maoist guerrillas at the time. Most of Latin America was being racked by violence. The, the world of Islam was relatively peaceful. If you looked at the 1920s, if you looked at the 1880s, when there was this great wave of, of, of liberalization and, and reform in the, in the Middle East. So what I'm trying to get at is the fact that you can find political, social, economic forces that seem to be at work is a hopeful sign because you can change those. And if you even looked at the variation within the Islamic world today, the vast majority of the violence tends to emanate out of the greater Middle East, which, as you know, accounts for a, sm a small percentage of the Muslims of the world, which is not to say there isn't retrograde, bad, fun you know, nasty stuff going on in Indonesia. But if you look at the violence, almost all of it is coming out of basically the, you know, the Syria to Nigeria uh, range and really four, five or six countries. There. So you have to ask yourself, why those places? Islam is a constant. We have a line in social science. You can't explain a variable with a constant. The violence varies from society to society. Why is it happening? You know, the, the, the religious part is the same. The doctrine, the you know, Quran is, is obviously is the same. So one, the one point I'm making is that the fact that you, if, if you focus on just the book, just the Quran, just the doctrine, you're missing something incredibly important that tells you why there are these varying levels of violence, why there are times of peace and times of war, times of openness. Time. I'm not disagreeing with you that there's always been some problem, and there's always been, you know, then there are inherent features of the religion that make it problematic, just as, frankly, there have been inherent features of Catholicism that made it very prone to being, being, being captured by kind of powerful political actors. But, but I come back to this point, and, and I, which is, I know that you want to change, you know, you want to reform the world, and I don't think doing things that, that seem to the vast majority of people, and I, I say this again as somebody who who knows not the, the kind of atheists who are celebrated in the West by people like you, 
but the actual reformers who are on the ground trying to make it a little easier to actually enact reform, for them, this stuff is all a kind of anti-Muslim assault, right? It's you're, you're painting their religion as bad. You're telling them that everything they believe, you know, that their religion is inherently bad, is inherently problematic. And it's the, it's the inherent part that I'm, that I'm objecting to. But I, I wouldn't use the word inherent to describe the whole religion. And, and, and again, everything I'm saying about Islam, a reformer like Majid Nawaz is also saying. Perhaps we can talk about for a moment how you may disagree with him, but I just want to, to react to what you just said here, because here you just made a move into history, now recent history, talking about the stagnation in the Arab world largely being a reason for these differences. but. Again, I, I would fully grant you that there are political and economic variables here that can make the problem worse. But what the analysis you gave doesn't capture is why, for instance, Palestinian and Egyptian Christians behave differently from their Muslim neighbors. I mean, so they, they haven't produced the same kind of death cult of suicide bombers, and yet they're living in the same stagnant conditions. In fact, their conditions are worse because they're preyed upon by their Muslim neighbors. Well, precisely, they're minorities. So you don't find Indian Muslims have not adopted the ideology of Hindu nationalism because they are the, they are the objects of it. I mean, that doesn't, hardly seems to me so difficult to understand. It's like asking, why did the Jews of Germany not adopt Nazism? No, but so why aren't Coptic Christians practicing suicide bombings against their Muslim neighbors in reprisal? Why aren't Palestinian Christians who have to go through the same checkpoints in Israel blowing up the Jews in reprisal in the same way, right? I mean, this is, this is just not happening. I mean, maybe you could find one such person who did this, but... No, 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 of course, of course you're right. But my, my, the point I'm trying to make is, of course, there is a, an element of this where, where, where the religion is feeding into it and the absolutism of the religion and, the, you know, parts of the... Or parts of the but they are but it is in combination with with these other forms. but i can give you the pure case which is now we have just ad nauseum from all the people in the west who have joined isis or groups like isis i mean so now we have people who could be third generation british citizens who have degrees in engineering or medicine or computer science who ha who have no plausible political grievances at all apart from the imaginary religious ones that suggest that they should go join a group like ISIS. Of course, and, that, and there are ideologies that attract w w misfit weirdos always. I mean, the Maoist, you know, the Ma violent Maoist guerrilla movements attracted a lot of crazy uh, Westerners. I mean, that, that, you're, you're now trying to explain a very large phenomenon by looking at a few hundred isolated... But it's not a few hundred, I, but I, I'm just saying that Here's my core criticism, which has always been my criticism. I've always recognized that among 1.7 billion Muslims, the percentages that will ascribe to any one strand of the belief is, is always, you're only talking about those specific percentages when you're talking about specific beliefs. But here we're talking about a real belief, a sincere belief in martyrdom and jihad, right? I mean, this, this is the mind virus that I think we have to oppose, and that Muslims, above all, have to find some way to oppose. So let me tell you why I object to the way in which you characterize the problem. If we do have to oppose it, telling people that it, is, it comes straight out of the text of their religion, out of a book that, that 1.7 billion people believe is the word of God, is not helpful. But the doctrines around jihad and martyrdom do come straight out of the texts, I mean, especially if you take the texts in their totality, not just the Quran, but the Hadith. Right. So, so all I'm saying to you is, so either you take the view that, that, you know, these things are rich, complex historical documents that have changed and have been interpreted variously over time, uh, and that there are periods where people did not interpret it this way. For the 400 years of the Ottoman Empire, for 300 years of the Persian Empire, for the entire period of the, of the Egyptian uh, monarchy, it was not, it was not interpreted th that way. The Muslim Brotherhood was founded in you know, the early 20th century, not the early 15th century. So, Fareed, what, we're, we're going to, one of us is right about the history, but it doesn't matter. The, but actually, it does matter because if you're right, then frankly, there's no hope, right? There's, there's no point. There's, that would be a very dispiriting conclusion to arrive it's at. It's the but, only one one could arrive at from on the basis of your analysis. If you say, you're saying that if the Quran and the Hadith and the biography of Muhammad, if, if 
if jihad has basically always been holy war in that, that context. And there's some, you know, there's a kind of esoteric interpretation of jihad as an inner spiritual struggle. That's a component of it, say. But if holy war has always been what jihad has meant in the first definition, you're saying we are doomed. There's no way. Either we have to rely on a history where there were some centuries where that wasn't the case, or we're just doomed? Well, I, I ask you, if, if what you are saying to people is the only way you could believe, be a believing Muslim um, and renounce jihad is to essentially reject all the, 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 the texts and the, and, the, and the history and tradition of your religion, all I'm saying is you're asking people, which you have done in the past, essentially to convert, to, to become non-believing Muslims. And all I'm saying is you, that ain't going to happen, Sam. So if, you're, if your goal is actually to reform, then 1.7 billion people aren't going to say, damn, why didn't I think of this? Sam Harris is right. Um, you know, this is a terrible religion. It's full of violence and religion. I should renounce it. Fareed, let's take the simpler case. This is the simplest possible case. This is really without any possibility of are having a difference of opinion here. The punishments for theft are mandated in the Quran. You cut the hand of the thief, right? Now, this has always been in the Quran, and it has always been the punishment for theft. And now, I'm sure you'll agree that many, many millions of Muslims have realized from some process of having a dialogue with themselves and with, with modernity and its new norms they have realized that they don't want to live this way. They're happy to live in societies where thieves don't get their hands cut off. But that's precisely my point, Sam, which is that they don't think of themselves as having rejected Islam. They don't think of themselves as having rejected the religion. They simply believe that, you know, societies, the, the culture, the politics the, uh, evolve. And all I'm saying is if you confront them uh, with a stock, with this, this, if you say to them the only way you can, you can uh, you know, re reject jihad is to essentially reject the Quran and Muhammad, they're going to say no. Um, if instead you say, you say these standards are evolving, they can, they can be interpreted in various ways. I, I guess what I'm saying is that the way even Christianity evolved, is not, somebody didn't say, look, everything that, people, that, God said, that you've been told about Deuteronomy is, is simply wrong that all those prescriptions don't exist. People, you know, society evolved. You, 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 you soften the interpretation of some paragraphs. You highlight the interpretation of others. That's, that's the task I think you should be, you should be uh, working on rather than trying to play this game of saying this stuff is all deeply in the religion and, it, and, you know, and, you, and let's not pretend otherwise. All I'm saying is what good does that do you? Is that going to get you? Is that going to make people say, "Oh, yes, we, you know, we're going to reform the religion," or is it going to get their backs up and make you make them think Sam Harris is is castigating and insulting our religion? My experience from having actually spent a lot of time in Muslim communities is they feel the latter. They feel attacked and besieged. I guess there's one point of confusion here is that I really do wear two hats for the purposes of a conversation like this. You know, I am an atheist who who has a general criticism of all faith-based religion. I think modernity and, and rationality and, and science need for the long game to win all of those arguments. But with respect to Islam in particular and, and, and the need to reform it, I'm not trying to win the argument for atheism. Here I'm, I'm very aligned with someone like Majid Nawaz, who, as, again, as a Muslim reformer, is making the same kinds of points I'm making now. You have to talk about the fact that the problem actually is this bad, that ISIS does have a very plausible interpretation of the texts, that they're living in a way that would be absolutely recognizable to Muhammad and his closest supporters in, in the 7th century. And, you know, taking sex slaves, for instance, you can't pretend that sexual slavery is forbidden under Islam because it's not forbidden under Islam. So Muslims have to find some way to forbid it in concert with a larger conversation about how we want to live in this world. And so you're, you're, say, you're saying that... But it is forbidden in, every, in virtually every Muslim society. It's, you know, the, this is hardly a difficult or controversial issue. In, in Indonesia, the largest Muslim society in the world, it does not, does not allow sex, sexual slavery any more than, you know, I mean, obviously some of it exists in many of these uh, countries, unfortunately. But I guess, but why not be honest about how they got there? 
what we need is a confrontation with the fact that these texts as written, you know, the moment you admit that you don't want thieves' hands cut off, you are now giving God less scope over your life because God told you what to do with thieves. I guess maybe the broader difference between us is, I, and, and perhaps this is, I don't know, I, I actually don't think the way religions get reformed is by having uh, a, a, you know, somebody point out all the uh, backward, reactionary, oppressive aspects of the, of the religious texts and, and, and demeaning them and, and, and sort of insulting them. I think the way that religions reform is that the society evolves and reforms around it politically ideologically, religion, you know, in, in, in every way, women become more full participants in society. And then the religion plays catch up. That's what I think happened with Christianity. That's what I think is happening with Islam in those societies in which it really is, you know, moving forward. I've, I've seen it happen in a, in a country like India, in a country like Indonesia, still a long way to go, still many retrograde elements. But what happens is that the, the society in general uh, modernizes, and then the religion kind of has to play catch up. I think that that reform process is much more durable than somebody just, you know, focusing in on the religion, and expecting some kind of theological breakthrough where somebody is going to say, "Oh my God, you know, the Quran is all wrong." Because I think that while that is that is that that gets you a lot of applause lines in the West, I don't think that most Muslims in these, particularly in these developing societies where their religion is a very, very core part of their identity, are going to go for that. They're, they're going to go for a much more indirect and subtle and, uh, you know, kind of complicated view, as you point out. In every Muslim society, other than, frankly, Saudi Arabia, uh, you know, the, the, the uh, amputation of hands is not allowed, and Muslims happily live with it, even though it does exist, you know, that punishment is uh, recommend, you know, prescribed in the Quran. So what doesn't that tell you that the way, that the, the way forward is more the way I'm describing a broader reform agenda that doesn't try to single out the religion as the as the as the problem which has to therefore be be somehow cast aside or discarded or uh, you know kind of uh, you know re rewritten because to do that uh, is all I'm saying is you're not actually going to get the results on the ground that you want and I think that we do share that. I think you're way too quick to say that. I fully take your point that. There's this other process of just having the religion collide with everything else that's going on in culture, and that provides a moderating influence. And, and whether you have to spell out why that's all happening in each instance or not, that's to your taste or not. But there's this other feature, which is given how much people care about the theology and they care that what they're doing is scripturally correct, it becomes immensely powerful to find well-grounded theological ways to get around these intolerant and divisive and, and violence-producing bits. So if you can have theologians, if you, if, if you know that the greatest theologians in Cairo can come forward with a, with a fatwa on whatever point with respect to apostasy or blasphemy or, or jihad or the rights of women, to actually plant a flag on new ground where everyone can see it. Here is why when a woman claims to be raped, you don't need four witnesses, right? You, need, you can actually submit to a normal secular court process, right? If, if, if such a ruling could ever come down. Yeah, but those people would, would, would find that they were arguing against you, uh, who would say, no, 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 it's pretty clear. This stuff is all in the Quran. That, that's all, all I'm saying is that you're, you're actually making those people's lives much harder by your continual insistence on a highly literal... You're, you're the, that's, that's what I meant when I said you and ISIS were in agreement, which is, or Al-Qaeda, which is, you know, it's the reformists, it's the liberals who are trying to massage the text, let's be honest. And you're the one who keeps pointing relentlessly back. Who's, who's being helpful? There you've carved out a role for me that really I, I will never fulfill. There's no cleric who is worried what I think about the, the basis of their ruling. You won't be cited as an expert. I'll, I'll give you that. But, but I guess, yeah, think about it this way. Uh, Sam, it was Vatican II. It took Vatican II, which is what, 1962, before the Catholic Church formally renounced the idea that the Jews killed Christ. That's, that's a generation after the Holocaust. But Fareed, you're proving my point. It's, it's very important that the Catholic Church did that. 
rather than all of us just wait for the Catholics to come to their senses without putting any pressure on them. No, no, but but there you get into a really genuinely difficult problem, which I wish, you know, I, I don't know how I feel about, but the Islam is more like radical Protestantism. There is no cent- central authority. So when you talk about the imams in, uh, in, um, in Cairo, one of the challenges has been, I've been in Indonesia talking to reformist movements there, and I say to them, Does, hasn't it helped you that Al-Azhar now, because as you know, they have had a lot of these, these guys issue fatwas like that. And the guy in Indonesia tells me, nobody cares. Our local imam says his interpretation is, is superior to, you know, to these guys. Uh, and a lot of those imams around the world, unfortunately, have been trained and infected by Saudi Arabia with the kind of Wahhabi uh, ideology. And so Islam doesn't have a single source of centralized authority. To, to, you know, so that makes it much harder. Um, and so all I'm saying is all the more reason to emphasize a kind of bottom-up reform that encompasses the whole society. My only point here, really, and, and again, this is something that I'm now mindful of your time, so I, I want to bring this into the into the end zone here, is that I, I feel like you're not seeing how talking about the problem, even the way I do, but especially the way someone like Majid Nawaz does. And again, we, we make very much the same noises on this particular strand of the conversation, where I, I talk about Islamism and not Islam per se. This is really under his influence. I, I talk about the desire to force Islam, the religion, onto society as being Islamism and jihadism being the violent strand of that. But talking about this as a unique problem for one religion at this moment, what this does is that it does acknowledge the unique burden that is placed on the shoulders of those people who are trying to reform it now. I mean, the, the Mormon reformers do not have as quite the, the same job that Muslim reformers do. Yeah, and I, I've, ne- I've never, uh, never argued otherwise, but I would say, and what I, what I try to do by emphasizing the reality that, that Islam can be different, has been different, that Muslim societies have the capacity to be more tolerant and have done it historically, what I'm doing is trying to make Muslims and Muslim societies understand that they, re- they don't have to renounce their religion to be, to be more reform-minded. They don't have to you know, uh, they don't have to abnegate, they don't have to become uh, atheists, that there is a path here where they can find some way to make their religion compatible with modernity. And I would argue that that is more likely to be a a strategy that takes, that moves uh, Islam into the modern world, you know, more securely and more surely than any other. You know, I may be wrong, but as I say, I feel like I, you know, this this is a world I know pretty well. And I, I do think that sometimes there is a, a difference between trying to make a point that will attract a lot of attention in the West and make a difference that is going to be felt on the ground in these societies. Then do you actually think of your approach as being different from Majid's? I mean, do you actually, would you just consciously disagree with the calls for reform that he makes? No, I don't. I, I you know, I, I, I don't, I'm not um, as familiar with with all of his work as I should be, but I think what I would really emphasize, and what is the is the work of political and economic reform that 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 is taking place in Muslim societies. That you know, you, where you try to modernize the societies, you try to make them live in a modern context. Again, let me give you a simple example: Dubai. Okay, if you go to do, if you ask any Muslim anywhere in the world. I'm obviously exaggerating, but like, where would you like to live? Dubai. Dubai is the place that they feel that they are not compromising their Muslim identity, but it feels open and free and, you know, modern. Now, the United Arab Emirates is a Wahhabi country, okay? So if you were to look on the books, what they allow, what they don't allow, but as a practical matter, they have made peace with modernity, and they have made peace with modernity in a way that allows minorities, you know, religions and people from all over the world to work there. So I guess what I'm trying to say is that a, there's a certain um, practical reform that I think is, is much harder to do, uh, which needs to be done. I respect the, the work that people like Majid, um, Majid do. I respect, you know, the work that a lot of other reformers do. As long as they, it doesn't morph into something that can, can be seen as uh, a kind of frontal assaults on uh, the 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 religion itself. 
not because I have any particular sensitivities about it, but because I think it actually is totally counterproductive. And I think that it, you know, it's something that might get you funding from some some sources in the West, but it's not actually going to do much for you in those in you know in these countries because there is this feeling of being besieged in 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 a large parts of the Muslim world. And if you're trying to change them, you don't want to set that off. It's a, it's sort of like you know Americans never understand nationalism. They never go into other countries and and understand that. You may have a very good idea, but people don't want it imposed from a, from without. They don't want to feel that they are the 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 the, the little you know a, a mouse being trampled on by the eight hundred pound gorilla. And there is that feeling uh, after four hundred years of Western uh, uh, dominance uh, in in large parts of the Muslim world. So if you want to change it, just be aware of that sensibility. Before I um. Let you go, Fareed. And again, you've been very generous with your time. And so um, I just will acknowledge to our listeners that you and I haven't said uh, anything like our last word on this topic or really any of the others. We haven't even said a first word on some of the topics I wanted to cover, like China and North Korea and other things in the news that no doubt you have a lot to say on. There's a phrase that my my friend, who I, again, I've, I've mentioned Ali Rizvi, who wrote The Atheist Muslim, recently tweeted, which I thought was very useful, which kind of cuts through this issue of how do we talk about this particular problem of Islamism, say, without aligning ourselves or seeming to align ourselves with, you know, the alt-right or, or bigotry against Muslims. And the point he made was the left is wrong about Islam and the right is wrong about Muslims. And that strikes me as very useful. I'm just, I just wanted to put that into your head because, you know, this, you're often in the position of worrying that a criticism of Islam, the set of doctrines, is grading into or giving energy to the wrong sort of sentiment about Muslims as people. And it's, it's, you know, it's, it becomes an expression of xenophobia, say. And, and this, this, for me, dissects it really nicely. I mean, the left is wrong rather often about Islam. I mean, whether you want to say the left or the far left, but I mean, when we have the hijab being used as a sign of female empowerment, and we have someone like Linda Sarsour, you know, being lionized as a, as a feminist, that suggests a fair amount of confusion on the left about just what it means to empower women and just how many women over the world over wear the hijab voluntarily. But the right is clearly wrong about Muslims. I mean, the, the bigotry against immigrants just because they're immigrants and all the noises we're getting from Trumpistan on this point are clearly energizing a, a, a kind of hatred of people and a fear of people that, that we, we, we don't want to give any, any energy to. So I just wanted to, to throw that at you, Fareed, before I, I let you go. You know, that's a, that's a very interesting way of thinking about it. And I guess what I would say is um, one of the challenges then for, for, for you, uh, it seems to me, is that when you do make the, 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 the criticisms of Islam, to, to try to keep in mind that, that point I was making, that for the vast majority of Muslims, um, they haven't chosen this religion. They are born into it, and so and and they're born into it, and it makes sense of if it helps them make sense of the world and where the way in which in you know billions of other people are born into some religion or faith system, and and it makes sense. Of, and so when you do criticize it, it does often seem to them as if you are not just being anti-Islam but anti-Muslim, and. You know, if you're given what what your goal is, it does seem to me that's that's one to think about, right? Which is how best to do that. But in any event, the main point I would make is I think you you do, you do an an extraordinary job of allowing somebody to disagree with you in a not just in a civil way, but in a friendly way, but in a productive way. And I learned an, an awful lot from our exchange. I really respect the fact that you gave me the time, the platform, the opportunity to talk about it, uh, and the fact that we can, we can still be uh, admirers and, and perhaps even friends at the end of this. Yeah, yeah. Well, to be continued, Fareed, I, I really appreciate the time you gave me. And this is, people should know, I, I grabbed uh, at least a, a full extra half hour of your schedule greedily and uh, still don't feel like I, I got enough. So we will talk again in some of the context and I wish you uh, the best with everything you're doing because I watch your show every Sunday morning and you are keeping me sane, at least for that hour. <laughs> Thank you so much, Sam. Pleasure. Take care for it. If you're enjoying the Waking Up podcast, you can support the show directly through my website at samharris.org forward slash support. 
and please know that your support is greatly appreciated. It's listeners like you that make this show possible.